All right. Um, well, just give me a second. Oh, you Sorry. got to <laughs> gotta work that magic. <laughs> yeah, it takes a second. Sorry. Be just there in a minute. Okay, you may go ahead. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to uh, Heritage Berry. And uh, we have a full agenda, so we'll get started right away. Um, first on the agenda, we have a presentation concerning the Armory Building uh, Roof Replacement Project. And I think we have a, um, a presentation by somebody, Thomas. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, um, we do have a presentation by Garrett. Uh, he's from our facilities department. And I just wanted to do a, a very brief introduction before uh, handing the their reins over to Garrett. Um, so the purpose of today's presentation is to discuss the roof replacement on 36 Mulcaster, which is a designated uh, heritage building in the city of Barrie. Um, the uh, changes, or sorry, the uh, installation of a new roof um, will result in an alteration to a designated heritage building, uh, which is regulated under the, under the Ontario Heritage Act, Section 33. So Garrett uh, is also here today to ask um, committees, um, ask committee to pass a motion recommending the council um, approve the alteration to the building, being the installation of the, uh, uh, sorry, the replacement of the roof. And um, I'll get I'll let Garrett to, to take over and discuss why the roof needs to replace, how we're replacing it, and all the fun stuff. So I will mute myself and now hand it over to Garrett. Thanks very much. Okay, welcome, Garrett. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Tomas, for the uh, brief introduction there. I'm a project manager with the City of Barrie at the Capital Facilities Department here, and um, yeah, I think Tomas did a great job of kind of covering the intent of this presentation. So without further ado, I will try and figure out my sharing options here for getting this presented. Let's see, share presentation. There we Can go. everyone see that? You're good. Fantastic. All right, so um, the Mulcaster Street Armory building, uh, we're looking to do a roof replacement at this location. Um, and uh, there's a proposed alternate material which we're bringing forward to the committee for consideration here. So uh, some brief history uh, in case anybody's not fully aware, but 36 Mulcaster was uh, built in 1888 and 1889 for the 35th Battalion, Simcoe Foresters Volunteer Militia. After the First World War, it became occupied by the Barrie Board of Works. Uh, the board then relocated and the facility became home to a farmer's market for a period of time. But now it is currently home to the Gray and Simcoe Foresters Regimental Museum, named under the Organization of Military Museums Canada. So we're here before the committee tonight to outline the scope of work for the project and present the recommendations of an alternate roofing material for your consideration. Use of this product will maintain the aesthetic heritage elements of this facility's roof finishes and provide extended protection uh, of the city's asset at a reduced cost. The existing cedar shake roof is at the end of uh, its life cycle and needs to be replaced in order to prevent further damages to the building structure and interior elements through potential water infiltration. The current roof finishes are comprised of natural cedar shake roofing installed over what appears to be a felt underlayment on top of wood planking, which is secured to the wood roof, uh, sorry, wood roof rafters, uh, complete with uh, pre-finished metal flashings and eaves trough. Uh, based on a condition assessment that, that was performed by the CCI group in 2016 and 17, it's believed the existing cedar shake roof was installed in 1996 as part of renovations to this facility. Uh, based on recent observations from a site review, uh, the following observations were noted. The cedar shake roof shows signs of aging nearly at the average lifespan of a typical 30 year life expectancy for cedar roof shakes. Um, some existing repairs are visible on the cedar shake roof. 
signs of moisture infiltration and staining were observed on the wood wood plank substrate from the attic hatch of the high roof, uh, although it's unclear as to when these uh, stains were created and it appears to be dry now. Visual inspection of the attic uh, hatches noted a few locations where wood planking a substrate is cracked or damaged. And the low roof areas uh, through the attic, roof attic hatches, you can actually see some signs of daylight uh, showing through there. So some photos were taken. And uh, as you can see here, there's been some replacements of cedar shake, uh, some chipping and cracking along with other signs of uh, deterioration from moisture and snow sitting on top of uh, the cedar shake roof. It's kind of natural natural look of the aged cedar shake, but it is showing signs of being at the tail end of its life there. The uh, damaged substrate, this is also quite common with uh, older wood, but um, we've got some cracking along the um, knot line of the, the wood, which hasn't compromised the roof per se, but uh, that would be part of the repairs uh, done to the roof itself. And then down into the uh, low roof areas, you have uh, signs of daylight showing along the abutment where the, uh, the roof framing meets the brick walls. So with uh, some research that I've done, EnviroShake came up as a very promising product uh, to consider for this project. It's a composite roofing product, uh, which replicates the natural appearance of Cedar Shake with multiple added benefits. The extended lifespan is probably one of the largest uh, considerations to make here uh, in that it reduces costs for the city, whereas the cedar shake roof would likely have to be replaced yet again before the life of uh, Enviro, Enviro Shake product would actually see the, the end of its life cycle. Uh, Enviro Shake comes with a lifetime 50 year warranty, whereas cedar shake roofing would only come with a one year contractor's warranty. Um, Extended manufacturer's warranties can be purchased. However, they come at a substantial cost and only provide limited protection and coverage. The authentic look of natural number one grade uh, tapered split cedar shakes is actually generated by Enviro Shake by using uh, 3D imaging to uh, replicate the real cedar shakes and shingles. There's uh, two different color options which emulate natural cedar roofing in various stages of life. And uh, real wood fibers are used along with uh, cellu cellulosic fibers to capture the uh, authentic aesthetic and thickness of uh, natural cedar shakes. The maintenance and durability aspect of EnviroShake actually carries multiple added benefits here where it's mold, mildew, insect resistant, it will not crack or peel, it's fire retardant. It actually carries the highest impact certification level available. And it's freeze thaw resistant with a high wind resistance rating, which when considering uh, various weather is highly ap applicable to the fact that we see some really strong winds off the bay, and not to mention tornado type weather that we've seen over the last few years. So uh, EnviroShake actually provides a warranty against strong winds of that nature, and they would uh, cover the cost to replace any damages associated with that. Uh, the last point here to consider too is that EnviroShake's actually environment, environmentally friendly with 95% of the content derived from repurposed uh, post-industrial polymers and elastomer fibers. I took a few images off of uh, EnviroShake's uh, website here. So it kind of just summarizes over here a lot of what I just went through, but some things to note here that EnviroShake actually meets and exceeds uh, Miami-Dade requirements. It can withstand winds up to 290 kilometers an hour, which is uh, quite, quite remarkable. Um, the eco-friendly aspect, the 95% the repurposed materials I already mentioned, but the water runoff is potable. It's 100% recyclable material. Uh, I covered the maintenance aspects and the life uh, lifetime warranty. Hail protection, should we see that? It has the highest hail impact rating, a class five impact resistance. 
uh, it comes at some cost savings and considering the life of cedar shake installations and how we're not actually at the full 30 year average life right now for cedar shake but the the roof is showing signs of needing to be replaced and then the aesthetics the unmatched uh, authentic look of cedar uh, shake they note slate here because they also provide a slate like uh, product but um, yeah uh, as you can see over to the right there's uh, two different colors the silver uh, cedar and the aged cedar and I actually have a couple of products here. I'm not sure that they're necessarily of use to us since we're not meeting in person, but um, should anybody care to see those in, in person, I'd be happy to send them over to you. Um, EnviroShake has actually been used on numerous historical buildings throughout Canada and the United States. Uh, here in Barrie, the South Shore Community Center actually has uh, EnviroShake installed on this roof. I took those photos that you can see in the slide presentation here, just to illustrate the, the look of it. I'm not sure that you'd get the full uh, appearance of it, but it actually looks quite nice. And I personally thought before even knowing that that was EnviroShake, that it was Cedar Shake. So um, there's multiple other installations throughout Stratford, Sutton West, Hamilton, Collingwood, uh, Burlington, Montreal, and some examples throughout uh, the United States that I've listed for you here, but the list actually carries on quite further in terms of what EnviroShake has provided to me. So with that, um, we are seeking the Heritage Committee's endorsement of the following. A, altering the proposed building, Armory Building 36 Mulcaster Street, for the purpose of replacing the existing roof and B, the endorsement of the use of EnviroShake as the preferred material for the new roof replacement. That concludes the relatively short and brief to the point presentation, but I'd be happy to take any questions should anybody have any at this time. All right, great. Thanks, uh, Garrett. Um, any questions from committee members? No. Yell out because I'm not sure I can see you all. But I, I have a few questions. If okay, go ahead, Kathy. Um, so, um, a couple questions. Um, who actually does? So, you're purchasing the roofing. Who actually does the work? That would go out to tender or to a contractor, and it's uh, under EnviroShake has multiple uh, certified contractors, and that would be a stipulation of the requirements here. Um, sorry, am I still sharing my screen with everyone or no? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get out of it. But uh, yeah, so it, the uh, here we go. It's up on the wrong screen. That's why. Um, it would go out to tender to a contractor, but it would have to be one of their certified installers in order to get that 50 year uh, warranty, which would be written into the plans and specifications for the project. Okay, and would would the same crew um, have done, uh, say, for instance, the South, so uh, a, a designated building as well? So it would, I don't want you like I you know I wouldn't think that we would want Joe's Roofing, right? Who has never who maybe has put this uh, you know product on, but not actually worked around a, a designated building, and right. you know make sure that they're being very careful. Yes. Not to damage any of the existing. That, that is another element too that we'll, we'll be working with the, our consultant to build into the plans and specifications to adhere to all heritage elements to obviously protect uh, the, the area in general. But um, that with that said, all of the certified installers have to adhere to certain elements to become certified by EnviroShake. Uh, anybody can purchase this product, but we're looking to achieve the 50-year lifetime warranty with the, this project and move it forward in that way to protect this asset and extend the life of the, the installation to come. And um, At the same time that you're doing the roofing or you had a look at the roofing, um, is there any uh, work that needs to be done on the brickwork and the pointing? And I know it's just roofing now, but can you see that at some point we need to do any brick work? 
correction to the brickwork and or pointing. So, you know, you talked about how water was getting in somewhere and it was obvious from one of the pictures. Uh, if you can see daylight, that's where the water's coming in. Yeah, uh, it, well, it, that area, sorry to interject there, but the, the area where I observed light coming in actually didn't show signs of moisture coming in. And what I believe that is, it had an overhang over top, which okay. is protecting direct, uh, like elements from coming down against it. Um, what it appears to be from is that the framing of the wood roof, it has a bit of a gap and then the metal flashing above is just allowing light to shine through. So we'd likely look to get the uh, contractor doing the installation to seal up that, that gap or crack and uh, make good in that, that area. Okay. And it's hard to tell the color um, based on, you know, what we're seeing here, but did you, um, based on, you know, the silver or the, I forget what the other color was called, do you have a, sort of a recommendation on what maybe looks most suitable for that building? I, I'm not sure how, how far my opinion would go in terms of, uh, this is obviously just my opinion, but I personally like the uh, aged cedar more because it obviously too would carry with it the idea that it's been there for a while and it, it looks uh, a little bit more, like, I don't know if this actually is visible, but you've got two different color products oh, right. here. Yeah. So this is the aged, which... Uh, so I think that sort of looks like what the South Shore Center has on it. Is that yes. the same? And, yeah. Uh, sorry, they also have, there's Enviro Shake, which is what I just showed you. And then there's Enviro Shingle, right. which actually carries more of a, like a smaller profile. Right. Um, great product. I have to double check to see which one it was that was installed at the South Shore Center. But as I said, the South Shore Center actually fooled me in terms of thinking that it was a cedar installation so okay thank you okay any other questions comments no seeing none all right um uh, garrett needs to go home with a uh, with a uh, motion from us so we have um put together a motion for this um and i'll just read it uh, to you, that consent be granted in accordance with section 33 and 34 of the Ontario Heritage Act for the proposed alteration to a building designated under the Ontario Heritage Act being 30 Mulcaster Street for the purpose of a roof replacement with EnviroShake as described at the Heritage Berry Committee meeting dated April the 13th, 2022. All right. Um, any questions on that? Uh, Thomas, I see your hand up. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I think it's 36, Mulcaster. Um, uh, so just a slight correction. Oh, and I Tammy know. just uh, noted to me that we just want to add another line uh, that the proposed material for the for the new roof be um, the product by EnviroShake, whether it be the shingle or it be the actual cedar. Um, sorry, I'm, I can't remember the name, the name of the other product, but that, that we go with an alternate product, not actual cedar. Yes, I am. Um, and that's, I saw Tammy's little email come through and that's why I added the words uh, with EnviroShake. Oh, I'm apologies. Yeah. All right, any uh, discussion on that? Uh, Kathy? I, I just wanted to clarify. So are we, when he showed, when he just showed uh, Garrett, when you just showed the two things, one looks like a cedar shake and the other one didn't? No, it, well, sorry, one, one yeah. cedar shake, which this is cedar shake, the oh. lar larger oh, right. profile. Oh, the large version, okay. And then the other is a yeah. cedar shingle. It's just a, a smaller profile overall, but. Uh, so do we have to pick one or the other? Or is it? I personally don't think so. I. I I'm not frankly, sure. Which... We can leave it to the uh, to the building people to pick the right one. I think you know really what our job is to say is to this you know that we approve going with an Enviro Shake product as right. opposed to a cedar sh cedar shake, right? Right, but the cedar sh the cedar shake shingles look more like the the shingle, the smaller version. 
I think is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, I'll have, um, I believe the Cedar Shake, although they sent just this one profile, right. it comes in a multiple different profile sizing. So it still looks like the same type of installation that you have at the, uh, at the Sweet. armory building. But so uh, this, they've only sent single products of each one. So okay. this is all I got for the Enviro shingle. Mind you, if that's what we prefer to go with, then I'd be happy to include the note of Enviro shingle. Okay. Um, Jason, I see you've got a hand up. Uh, I just thought I would comment there. Um, our, our real intent is to uh, replace the look uh, as much as possible, look, like for like. So the Enviro, Enviro uh, shake is what we would be um, gearing towards. Yeah, and I think that, you know, as a committee, that's the kind of thing that we need to uh, give approval to as opposed to, you know, the detail and the size and that kind of thing. So, Would it be possible to uh, modify the, the motion to, to indicate Enviro Shake, Enviro Shingle, and then that way, uh, upon uh, further development of the design, we can determine which one it is that needs to be uh, implemented? All right, so you're suggesting that it should read with an Enviro shake and Enviro shingle? Yes, please. That would be, that would be fantastic. That's, that's clear enough. Then. Okay. All right. Um, we'll, uh, we'll amend it that way. Any more discussion or questions on the motion? All right. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Thank you. That carries. All right, Garrett, you've got your your uh, instructions on that one. So thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate your time. Okay. All thank right. you. Um, so then the next one is a presentation concerning the Bradford Street corridor. And I see Brett with us. I bet he wants to talk. But Thomas has his hand up. Thomas. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. I, uh, again, just want to do a brief introduction of the team uh, doing the presentation about the Bradford Street Corridor. Uh, with us tonight, we have Brett Richricks from our um, uh, infrastructure development uh, services team, as well as uh, the uh, member of the consulting team, Catherine. Uh, she is here. Um, and um, again, to this presentation does not require uh, any motions to be passed, no decisions need to be made. This is a, um, uh, an information only presentation to a committee to let everybody know, uh, let the committee know and anybody watching uh, who maybe have missed the PIC and has heritage uh, related interests, uh, what uh, the Bradford Street EA is all about, um, and why we're doing the work uh, and things like that. So uh, with that, I will pass it to Brett and Catherine. Thanks very much. All right. Go ahead, Brett, or Catherine, whoever's going first. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thomas, thanks again for an excellent introduction. I'm not going to take too much time, but again, it's Brett Gratrix. I'm the Senior Project Manager of Transportation Planning in the Development Services Department. And tonight I have Catherine Jim with me. Uh, Catherine is a project lead at SEMA Plus, who is a consulting firm that is doing the work on the Project DA. Uh, so to avoid stealing any of her thunder, I'm going to pass it over to Catherine. She will be giving a brief presentation on, on where we're at in the study and some cultural heritage findings and then open the floor up to questions. So I'll pass it off to you, Catherine. Great, um, everyone hear me okay? Just yeah. fine. Great, thanks Mr. Chair, thanks Thomas and thanks Brad for the introduction and good evening everyone. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen with a brief presentation so Let's see, everything on screen okay? Seems to be fine, thank you. Perfect. So SEMA Plus, we have been assisting the city in carrying out the Bradford Street Corridor Improvement Class EA study. Um, the downtown area of Barrie certainly has been growing through development and there are plans for intensification in the future. So the purpose of the Bradford Street EA, it is a long-term, uh, long-range corridor planning study to confirm multimodal needs um, in the area uh, for the city and to accommodate not only auto movement, but also for cyclists, pedestrian, and for transit. 
Our study looks at future transportation needs in the planning horizon of 2031, 2041, and 2051. Other elements also include improving traffic operations at intersections, uh, safety requirement, and also particularly at the intersections. Within the corridor improvement itself, there are also opportunities for streetscape and landscape enhancement, which we'll also be looking at. And through the EA study itself, uh, we'll be confirming the right of way that is required for these road and streetscape elements. And that will allow the city to comment on development applications that are coming in accordingly. I want to stress that there are no immediate capital works planned. Um, on, on the corridor, the shelf life of an EA study itself is 10 years. So given the long-term nature of future improvement, which we'll be identifying through the EA study, uh, an amendment uh, will likely be carried out uh, if improvement are not going to be taking place uh, within a 10 year time frame. And also likely there will be uh, significant changes in land use at that time. And even for that, uh, it's likely going to be warranting for uh, an EA addendum uh, in the future. However, like I said, the purpose right now is we wanted to make sure we have identified what is required with the right of way to allow the city to move forward uh, with development application and providing comment. This slide here shows that we are in a Schedule CEA process, which means we're going through the four phases as shown on screen. So phase one of the EA study, um, we have identified the problems and opportunities within the Bradford Street corridor. In phase two of the EA, we are identifying and evaluating alternative solutions. When I say alternative solutions, it means these solutions are functionally different in helping us solve our problems. In phase three, we'll be looking at design alternatives. So once we have identified a preferred solution, then we'll develop and assess a range of design options. In phase four of the EA, we'll be preparing an environmental study report, which documents the decision-making process of the EA study. This environmental study report will be placed on public file and members of the public and agencies will have an opportunity to review this report during the a minimum 30-day review period. And in terms of study status, uh, we had our first public information center back in January this year. What we presented at the public information center includes the purpose of the study, which I just uh, went through very briefly, the planning context, a summary of the existing conditions, which include the socioeconomic environment, cultural and natural environment, as well as transportation conditions, and not just in terms of the road operation, but also the planning of active transportation and future plans of the Allendale Transit Mobility Hub. At the Information Center, we also presented the problems and opportunities for Bradford Street based on all the background information we have gathered, which basically boiled down to there's a need to provide a multimodal transportation um, uh, uh, solutions to accommodate future growth and, and also adjacent land uses while looking at opportunities for improved streetscape to make it an inviting and vibrant, vibrant environment. At the first information center, we also reviewed a range of alternative solutions that may be addressing the problems and opportunities and also some high level concepts of active transportation facilities that may be provided on the corridor as well as intersection improvement concept at Tiffin Street. Currently, we're undergoing the evaluation of these alternative solutions and the preferred alternative solutions will be presented at the upcoming Public Information Center in late spring. And later on in my presentation, I will give a rundown of what those alternative solutions that were presented. Certainly the consideration of built heritage resource is a key component of our EA study. A cultural heritage report has been prepared to inventory known and potential built heritage resources and cultural heritage landscape in the study area. The background historic research is used to determine the presence of sensitive heritage areas that correspond to 19th and 20th century settlement and development patterns. In addition to this research, the Ministry of Heritage, Sports, Tourism, and Cultural Industry screening tool and professional expertise is also used to identify properties as potential built heritage resources and cultural heritage landscapes. So key findings include 
nine built heritage resources and 12 cultural heritage landscape uh, within our study corridor as uh, being um, heritage resource or having heritage potential. Three of these properties are listed on the Municipal Heritage Register, including Tiffin, uh, 50 Tiffin Street and 168 to 170 Bradford Street. The Allendale Station is also designated under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act and is located adjacent to our study area. Heritage resources will be considered throughout the decision-making process of our EA study. Once a preferred design has been selected in Phase 3 of the EA, the report will be updated again to include a heritage impact assessment and recommendation for mitigation measures. This map here came from the heritage report and it depicts the location of the identified built heritage resources and cultural heritage landscape in the study area. Please note that this slide was also included in our first public information center package and it may be revisited again for further detail on your own time within the context of other information shared at the information center. The takeaway message here is the consideration of built heritage resources is going to be one of the elements in our consideration during the EA, given the presence uh, that it has in our study area. As I noted before, we presented a range of alternative planning solutions at the first public information center. I want to give uh, a quick rundown of what they are uh, for you this evening. So there are six in total. Uh, the first one is do nothing, which means it's maintaining the existing corridor with no improvement and really it serves as a baseline uh, as a comparison to other alternatives. The second option we look at is access management that focuses on integrating surrounding land use redevelopment to reduce the number of individual driveway and accesses to improve traffic flow and reduce the number of potential points of conflict with pedestrian and cyclist. The third option is operational improvements, which include intersection reconfiguration, such as a signalized intersection or a roundabout, two-way center turn lane and other changes um, as, signal as, as well as signal timing improvement are also uh, falling under this option. The fourth option we looked at is Bradford Street Corridor Improvement. This will address the multimodal and traffic operational needs on the corridor, including the provision for cycling facilities, improved sidewalk, streetscape environment, improved transit infrastructure, and addressing geometric deficiencies while maintaining the existing four travel lanes within an expanded right-of-way. The fifth option is reduced travel lane on Bradford Street. This is similar to option four, but it looks at the reduction of travel lanes on Bradford Street. The last one, but not least, is improvement on other north-south corridor. So under that particular option, we'll be looking at or considering the improvement of other parallel corridor uh, that are um, parallel to Bradford Street. So the improvement will be on those parallel corridors rather than Bradford Street itself. So these six planning solutions alternatives are being assessed right now in terms of how they can address the problems and opportunities for Bradford Street. This slide here shows that we have, this is the range of factors that we're using when considering the evaluation of, altern of the planning solution that I just talked about. So the range of factors include socioeconomic environment, cultural environment, natural environment, transportation and technical factors. And within each group, we have also included a list of sub-factors that are relevant to the study. The preferred solution will have to be a best balance among the group of factors, among all the sub-factors that we're seeing here. And before I conclude the presentation, I just want to bring up the study schedule again as a reminder that our next step is to complete the assessment and confirmation of the preferred planning solution and prepare for our next public information center. Design related activities will follow after that in phase three. Please note that the study has its own website where you can find more background information of the study as well as uh, presentation from uh, the first public information center. And the website is shown on this slide right here. So with that, I want to um, ask my 
presentation. I want to see if there may be any questions. Larry, you got to turn your mic on. What a 2022 thing to do, right? <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I, if you could read my, read my lips, I was uh, thanking Catherine for a, a great presentation. And then I was asking if anybody had any questions. And uh, so uh, the first one I hear, I see is Catherine. <clears throat> Uh, is my mic on? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I actually attended the, the first um, session. So um, the, really the only question I have at this point is uh, one of the big things that we've been talking about is uh, the, our tree canopy. So, you know, as you, you're going along and you're looking at whether you have to expropriate land or uh, whatnot, uh, I want to just make sure that, you know, we look at additional tree plantings over time. So that would just be my one comment. Mm -hmm. or, and I'm assuming that that was going to be looked at anyway, but I just wanted to, again, uh, bring that one forward. Yeah, that's right. As part, and thanks for the comment and through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the, uh, as part of the EA study, we will be looking at opportunities for streetscape um, enhancement and, and landscape as well. So that will be looked at on a conceptual level. And certainly when this project does evolve into eventually a detailed design that uh, a more detailed landscape plan will be developed at that time. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Um, okay, is it okay if I ask one? Um, you said that you have a um, heritage report uh, that you've done um, and that you'll be updating later on, of course, but um, at the moment, I'm wondering, um, is that something you can share with us? Um, because I'm, I'm thinking that if you could send it off to Thomas and Thomas could circulate it to committee members, perhaps the committee members would be interested in seeing that and maybe also offering some thoughts on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually the report, I think, uh, it has already been provided to Thomas for be, for review um, already. So I think uh, the the city should already have a copy that you know that that uh, can can be shared. Yep. Okay, uh, that's great. Um, and Thomas, um, I think it might be useful to just send that report out to committee members so they can all uh, be brought up to speed on um, on the heritage part of it, and uh, that way when it uh, the next go around will be a little more informed. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Well, if not, Brett and uh, Catherine, thank you very much for uh, your presentation tonight. That's uh, very useful. And uh, yes, you'll be hard at work and finishing that study and we'll look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Have a good Bye. evening. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, our next item on the agenda is the Allendale Go Station Art Project update. Um, who is going to tackle that one? Is, oh, there's Thomas for sure. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is uh, the, the reason this item is on the agenda is um, staff met uh, with uh, Metrolinx uh, just a few weeks ago um, before finally able to land a meeting with them. Uh, the discussion focused on um, what level of support the um, Metrolinx would be able to provide to the project, both <clears throat> in terms of uh, staff support as well as financial. Um, more stress on the financial component. If the committee recalls at the last Heritage Berry committee meeting, I sought um, I, or I asked the committee to look at um, uh, getting some or assigning some funds to this project uh, and then staff were directed to meet with Metrolinx to see if they could potentially fund all um, or a significant part of the project um, and the results uh, of that meeting was that Metrolinx uh, and, I'll, and I'll use their language Metrolinx will not look favorably upon a project that does not have seed funding from the community in which it's originated um, so essentially reading between the lines is if the city does not have some sort of funding, uh, then it's unlikely that they would 
contribute to uh, the project itself. So <clears throat> Uh, Carol and Ryan and myself, we did some high level estimates of what a project uh, of this scale sort of would cost. Um, and really our costs are based on the work area of the tunnel. Uh, but if committee recalls at the last meeting, um, we had decided that it doesn't necessarily have to be in the tunnel. So um, that it could be upstairs, it could be outside, uh, it could be in one of the, um, in one, inside one of the indoor waiting areas. Um, and the estimated cost of that project would probably be around fifteen thousand dollars. And um, it was, uh, it is my recommendation that committee uh, fund us a, a good component of that project so that we can go to Metrolinks and perhaps other city departments to see if we can get uh, funding to um, get an artist who can go do a good project on that site, uh, something that the city could be proud of, and it would be there for long term. And uh, the figure that we came up was around $5,000. So around a third uh, of the project costs would be covered by the committee. And then with that, we would be able to go to other committees, like I mentioned before, other departments, Metrolinks, potentially other funding partners, um, perhaps private sector funder, uh, funding if we can, and say, you know, we have this amount, we're looking to get a top up. It's, it's um, we think that that would look uh, better when we go to, to uh, Metrolinx in particular. So that would be my recommendation to the committees to uh, permit the expense of up to $5,000 uh, for the Allendale GO station art project. And I'm happy to take questions, of course, as well. All right, any uh, questions or comments on that one? Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, but we have it in, we can put it in our budget. We've got a bunch of money that's unallocated. Um, and if we went to, went to uh, Metrolinx and said, well, uh, you know, let's do a two for one deal. You, you put in 10,000, we'll put up five. Um, we might just get this project done. So um, any, uh, any further on that? Okay, it's in our budget, so uh, we can just instruct Thomas to go ahead on the five thousand, and uh, and then uh, uh, we will we have it in our budget anyway. So, all right. Any more discussion on that one? No. Yes, Craig. I was just going to say, uh, <clears throat> Thomas mentioned about maybe another department or anything. Like, is he thinking like the art committee or, or that group maybe would put some money into it or? maybe, I don't know, help with the design or something like that. Is that what he's thinking? Um, through you, Chair. Uh, Craig, that's a great question. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much funding is available to um, fund another committee's project, uh, but we will certainly check with them. I don't think that's a closed door. Um, uh, there's other departments that we could potentially speak to um, um, you know, I haven't, I don't want to put them on the spot, so I don't want to say it right here at the meeting, but I have a couple of ideas we could potentially go to and ask. Um, you know, I think one group we mentioned was Tourism Berry, so I could say them again, you know, it would be in their interest. Uh, so, you know, even if it's a thousand dollars or something like that to add to the project, if anything helps. Um, so those are the types of groups we'd be looking at uh, meeting with and asking for some funds. What? Uh, Kathy. Uh, what about um, BDAR as well? Uh, that's a great, uh, through you, Chair, that's a great uh, question, Kathy. Um, um, so Council has, I believe we passed a motion that uh, a few a few meetings ago that uh, we look at opportunities for BDAR to fund the Heritage Awards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it left some room for other sponsorship opportunities. So that's something we might be able to chat uh, with Tammy and, and the clerk about just to make sure we're okay to do that. But that's, I think that's a possibility. Yeah, okay. because we certainly have a number of real estate agents who live in Allendale as well. Um, so, you know, maybe that's, you know, whether it's done through BDAR or, you know, the three or four main real estate agents that I can think of that actually live here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could certainly, if we crafted a letter, we could go out and ask them if they'd like to participate. That's, mm -hmm. you know. Yes, absolutely. That's, um, I think we would need to get a, a, our proposal, proposal finalized 
And a, a big, big component of that, uh, Carolyn Ryan was telling me, is, is the actual budget, because then she can work around, work around that and provide more scope, more direction. Um, and it really, it's, it really bookends the proposal itself. So, but it's a good idea. Thank you. And I think, yeah, we, we really need to nail down Metrolinks uh, before we go too far with that too. Tammy, you just turned your camera on. Did you want to say something? No? Okay. No. <laughs> no okay. 2020 again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other discussion on that item? Okay. Thomas knows what to do. Um, the committee budget update is next. Um, and basically, um, if we, we've been talking about wrapping a couple of uh, utility boxes, uh, $2,000 each. So if we put 4,000 in the budget for that and 5,000 in the budget for, um, for the Allendale uh, project, um, then we still have uh, something in the range of uh, almost $3,000 that's unallocated at this point in our budget. I'm sure that as the year progresses, we probably will need some plaques or something. So um, that's sort of the high level um, on that. I might just, um, I know the town crier is right later on down the list, but it's also has to do with money. Uh, we talked uh, last time about uh, me having a chat with the town crier. Um, so I did that. Um, he's, you know, he's just full of enthusiasm. Uh, I think he would do this job for free. Frankly, um, uh, I checked with the clerk and the city itself pays him $675 a year. I don't know where that number came from, but anyway, that's what he gets. Um, and then uh, we have topped him up um, with an additional $200 um, uh, over the last couple of years. So um, I'm kind of in your hands in terms of what what you think you want to do. Um, my thought was that we would sort of um, uh, be very, we're very thankful for the work that he does. And if we, we brought it up so that he made, um, let's say a thousand dollars altogether, uh, which would increase, I think our, our contribution by about $125. Um, you know, would that, is that reasonable or, you know, there's probably other thoughts on that too. Um, Thomas. Oh, you're on mute this time. Well, I almost, I almost. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to give the committee a bit of information because uh, Mr. Travers did email me just to give me some information as to uh, the cost of what he does. So all of his entire uniform is custom made because obviously you can't buy these things off the shelf. Um, and a lot of it has um, what I would call maybe exotic material. So there's some silks and things like that. And it's not something you can put in the wash. So he has to get everything um, washed individually. And it's usually dry cleaned as well, um, as well as the shoes and everything. That's all sort of custom made stuff. So it has to be cleaned. And so those are the, some of the expenses he incurs doing his role. So um, the city has a remuneration um, that we that, uh, that the chair uh, referred to. Uh, so any other costs would likely go to just covering any cleaning and things like that. Or, or replacing any materials if there's you know unique buttons that are lost or something like that then uh it's all things that are not super easy to find <clears throat> all right any further comments on that silence all right are we okay to just move him up to a thousand dollars so that that would increase our contribution from uh 200 to 325 dollars that reasonable? Okay, I got some nods. Uh, Tammy, there you go. Um, all right. Uh, historic box utility wraps. Um, uh, Thomas, did you have something to say about that? I think in the in the intervene between the two meetings, uh, last meeting and this meeting, I think we've kind of come to the conclusion that uh, we would do two and, um, and that uh, I know um, Shelly was involved in that, and I think uh, Craig and Deb were going to pick the spots and pick the pictures, I think, um, or work on that. Does that bring you up to date? Anything else, Thomas, on that? 
Um, just to, um, the, only, the only thing that Shelley asked me to do was to give the committee a bit of a cost breakdown um, as to you know why they're costing two thousand dollars. So it's uh, one thousand two hundred and seventy two dollars for the wrap. Um, so this is not a typical wrap. It has an anti graffiti coating that is supposed to protect the wrap over the long term. It's also UV protectant and all that. So it's it's intended to last many many years. Um, also, these boxes are not flat around. They actually have multiple vents in them, so somebody has to go in and cut those around, um, and the wrap has to be printed to accommodate all that. Um, there's also a setup fee of three hundred eighty six dollars. Um, which is to exactly configure that wrap around the box. Um, so that brings us to $1,873 uh, with, with tax. That was a pre-COVID amount. So inflation and costs going up and things like that. There was an estimate of $2,000 per box. Uh, and just to give everybody an idea, those boxes themselves that are custom made for the city's light controls are around $20,000. So they're quite expensive units themselves. Um, so $2,000 to, to cover those boxes. Um, and the second thing was the deadline to actually select the images was April 29th or is April 29th, sorry. So we do have to, we won't be able to bring, um, images to this committee and make a selection. Rather, my recommendation was to pick, um, two members just to make that choice of the two images that would go on those, those boxes. Um, the recommendation from the team who does for a traffic from a traffic team is that it would be one image that would go around the entire box because when you have several images and what ends up happening is you get a space that's not used up and that's when it starts getting tagged. People will find a spot where they can tag it and then when you get invite one, the rest of them come as well. So it's best to get the entire thing wrapped with it with an image. Um, and my recommendation to the committee would be. Uh, uh, Deb, I'm sorry to do this, but uh, Deb has um, access to these images. Uh, she knows what images we have uh, or that are available as well. So, and perhaps Craig as well to be uh, a second set of eyes, but we would need those images uh, picked and given to our operations team by April 29th. That's okay. everything for me. All right. So uh, Deb and Craig, can you manage that? I see. I thought I got a nod from Craig. Um, yep. yep. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your work on that. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll have a little little opening ceremony when these things are installed, <laughs> right? <laughs> Sarah. Uh, I was just wondering, is our logo going to be anywhere on these or are they just going to be like the straight image? Like, is there any way to put a brought to you by in the bottom corner or something like that? <laughs> I, I guess that would be to me, council. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I don't know, Sarah, if I'm honest. I think if there was going to be a logo, it would be a City of Barrie logo. Um, and then if there's a City of Barrie logo, we wouldn't have a Heritage Barrie logo. But um, we can make the ask and we can throw mm -hmm. ours on there. Good sure. Yeah. We can always ask, right? Um, and maybe next time it can be brought to you by some realtor who's a member of BETA. Who knows? Um, all right. Do you need anything else, Craig or Deb, on that one? You're good to go? Um, the only thing I was going to say is, uh, so these are both going to be in Allendale, I believe. Um, so does anybody have any suggestions of maybe, so Deb and I can sort of, I know Deb's going to have all the stuff, but is there anything that I want to say, oh, I, I really like this? Like, Councillor Harris is the, the ward councillor and you know, uh, Kathy's in our area. So just any suggestions maybe, so we can sort of think about it. Yeah. All right, Councilor Harris. Good. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Craig, for asking. You know, I was wondering, and I guess it depends a little bit on where the location of the box is, but I, I know one area that I thought was of interest to me and maybe to others was around the Tiffin um, you know, Lakeshore, um, Bradford, Innisfil, where it used to be the downtown of Allen, Allendale. And if there could be some images that, that we have that could really, or an image that shows the down, the former downtown of, of Allendale, that would be of interest to me. And, you know, others 
you know, the old saying around, you know, the, 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 the downtown of Allendale will be pa paved in gold and the streets of area will be dirt, like that famous saying, you know, <laughs> it didn't quite turn out that way. But um, so I wondered about that as one, one option as far as something to be, to be uh, considered. So thanks for asking. Yeah, I think great suggestion, Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the two boxes will be installed at the uh, Burton and Milliburn intersection, as well as the Bayview and Burton intersection. So fairly central to uh, to Allendale. Right, that's all I wanted to just let, let you know where they are going to go. Thank you. Okay, so they're both on Burton and um, and, and not quite at uh, at downtown Allendale, but no, um, but Kathy. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. I forgot my mic was still on. I was going to say, but no, but that's good because you know the, an awful lot of people. You know, we've had a lot of movement in terms of uh, real estate and sales and people moving. Um, it, 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 you're right. Um, a lot of those people have no idea what the original part of Allendale did look like, and so there are some really great photos out there that show that area, like Essa, Essa, Tiffin, Lakeshore. You know, um, you know, even showed the old the old train in some of them, uh, you know, crossing the track where the movie house was. So yeah, and it just educates the people in the neighborhood. So they're always excited when they, you know, the, the Barry then and now stories that come up with all the pictures and stuff, people love those in our neighborhoods. And we share them on the, our um, Facebook pages, our two Facebook pages out of the neighborhood. So people love them. Okay, good. <laughs> But the only, other, uh, the only other thing I was going to say is because uh, there are two boxes kind of near each other. The one other thing I remember uh, Councilor Harris has always said it's about people too. So mm -hmm. maybe one of them buildings and one of them people or something to that effect because they are kind of near each other. I took pictures of them and sent them to everybody where the boxes are. And so maybe, you know, we can do something because people always love looking at old pictures yeah. of people that lived in the area. So we'll, maybe we'll do that too. That's great. Great ideas. Great discussion. All right. Anything more on that? We're good. Uh, oh. I have something. Oh, Kaylee. My video is not working today. Um, I just wondered if it was possible to do, depending on where they are, if um, you could get a picture of that street or something on that street so it's sort of reflective of the area that it's in rather than something further away. Um, or people that were there or building something to that street, but it might be difficult to find, but just a suggestion. Yeah, and I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay, anything else on that one? All right, then we'll move on to the one that I skipped over, and that is designating historic buildings in Barrie. Um, is that you, Thomas? It is. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is an item that's carried over from the last meeting. Um, at the last meeting, we were discussing uh, potentially uh, or identifying more buildings or which buildings the committee would like to investigate designating. Uh, at that time, I had recommended to the committee that we look at um, our current listed buildings and see if we can come up with a short list from those. Um, as you know, the committee has been in, has invited and we have sent letters to property owners of uh, heritage buildings that are not listed uh, at the moment, um, and we did not have success. Uh, so perhaps we, uh, I suggested that we would start with um, um, inviting listed buildings to, uh, to designate. So um, we do have a list. What we did is we digitized our municipal heritage register into an Excel table. It's broken down in, some, in columns. Um, I don't wanna throw it on the screen just now because it's a little busy. But what I was going to suggest is that I send this over uh, to the committee. Um, the committee look at picking, I would say, top three uh, of the listed buildings, and we can reconvene at the next meeting um, and pick those three buildings, and then we would pursue them. Um, that's just my recommendation. If anybody has a different mm -hmm. um, um, avenue to pursue this, um, I'm, of course, happy to, to oblige. All right. Any uh, comments or questions on that one? I think it's a great way to start. And um, uh, of course, knowing this committee, if everybody picks three, we'll have three dozen 
All right. So, but that's okay. We'll, we've got to start somewhere. So that's a good idea. All right. Thanks very much for that. Um, all right. The next item is the status of the Municipal Heritage Register. And there are two, uh, 101 Cumberland and 11 Rodney. Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and if I could, I just want to circle back quickly on the last item, designating historic buildings. Just wanted to give the committee an update that our motion for designating 125, 127 Dunlop Street East went through, I believe, general committee. Um, I did write a memo that supported that motion and everything went forward. So that is now going to council. So once that goes through council, I'll get a direction memo to issue a notice of intention to designate. And then we have the process under the Ontario Heritage Act to follow. So just a quick update on that. Thanks very much. Um, and now going back to the Municipal Heritage Register, that's correct. We have two um, uh, buildings, uh, one in Allendale, one in Kempenville Village. Um, so we'll start with 101 Cumberland. And I do have an evaluation form that I completed for that. And I'm just going to share it on the screen. Um, everybody knows Cumberland Street, um, the, the properties along Cumberland Street, actually, I'm going to throw it on Google Maps too. Uh, just so if anybody watching um, is interested. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Oops, that's not right. There we go. Okay, there we go. So this here is uh, 101 Cumberland. Um, it is uh, um, a typically Victorian home. It is representative of construction of, of the area. Um, the applicant does not know the exact date of construction, but it's assumed to be 1905. Um, um, the, uh, the owner has lived there for quite a while. Um, I believe it's 25 years. Uh, and they provided some images of them redoing the um, redoing some work. Uh, fun anecdote was that they actually, when they were doing some of the work um, on the property and they were peeling off some of the paint, they, they peeled off around seven layers of paint. Um, so um, just imagine how much work that was involved in stripping all that paint. Um, you know, it's got a, it's got a stainless uh, transom window, of course, in the front, and you can see that right here. Um, it's got a, a brick art, which is which is you know, um, unique, but it is uh, something that we see in Allendale. <clears throat> uh, the applicant referred to the um, the house as a subdivision house, and there is, I believe, seven of them that are very similar style in that area. Um, what else can I tell the committee about this property? Let me just open my evaluation form. Uh, the property doesn't have a name proper. Some of the some of the um, I guess more grand homes in, in Barrie um, do have uh, names, but this one doesn't. So, um, which is fairly common for, for buildings in Allendale. Um, however, so in my evaluation, I determined that the building does have contextual value as it is important to finding and maintaining, supporting the character of the area. And it is uh, um, physically, functionally, and more importantly, visually linked to its surroundings. Um, and as I mentioned, it is a Victorian home built uh, what we assume to be in the 1900s. Um, so turn of the century. Some notable features uh, is that it does have the original pine wood plank flooring, has the uh, stained glass transom window, which we discussed, and has to, you know, those original tall baseboards. Um, and it also has um, uh, some original millwork. So um, it's another good example of, 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 of a, um, a home in Allendale. So I would recommend to the committee that it be added to the Municipal Heritage Register. Okay. And uh, why don't we do 11 Rodney at, uh, now, and then we'll, um, we'll do them both in one motion. Okay. So 11 Rodney is, uh, is a, a pretty unique um, home, um, just because it's location um, and its story as well. So let me just do a quick street view as well. Uh, this one should be pretty familiar to everybody when you see it. And this one's neat because we actually have a 3D view of it from Google, if that would load. 
unfortunately, is not going to load for me today. There it is. Sorry, folks, just my internet's just a bit slow. There we go. I think that's pretty neat. So this is uh, 11 Rodney Street. So Rodney Street is, uh, is right here. Uh, this is Blake uh, going east to west. Um, and here is uh, the shoreline of Kempenfelt Bay. Um, so this one is, is unique uh, in that, you know, we don't actually see this design uh, very often throughout Barrie. It is referred to as the Glen Ormond Estate. Um, I don't actually have the, um, the history of the name uh, because it wasn't built by anybody named Glen Ormond. It was actually built by a gentleman named uh, John Dickinson by uh, uh, actually a fairly a famous contractor in, in the Barrie area, George Ball. He built a lot of the uh, homes in Barrie. Um, and the architect was Eustace Bird. Um, that name is, is new to me, but the contractor, George Ball, he built a lot of downtown Barrie and a lot of Allendale as well. Um, <clears throat> the architectural star style uh, is, is identified as Tudoresque Queen Anne. Um, and the Queen Anne buildings, um, I, can, I can show the committee some more if we have time, but they're actually quite um, ornate buildings. They're very unique. I had quite a bit, I uh, had a challenge actually identifying what these, um, what this building could be categorized as. Um, so the applicant did provide um, in their application form a link. Um, I think it's actually in an email, so I will have to go find my email. But um, I do want to show you some pictures of the inside. Um, so I do want to show that. So that's not it. Okay. So one second. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment, and I'm going to find the email. There it is. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. So this is the, um, everybody should be seeing my screen again. Yep. Uh, an image of Barry 360. So that is of course the building itself there. So I'm just gonna scroll down and show you the inside. It is pretty remarkable. Like uh, this very few buildings um, have this in Barry. Um, And it's been very well kept and restored. <clears throat> so after the original owner, um, I'm not sure if he had passed away or if he just sold the property, but he sold it to an individual named T E uh, J sorry T D Reese, which was the owner of a lumber company in New Orleans, um, and they actually used this home for um, for as, as a summer uh, getaway. Uh, so they actually used the rail to come from all the way from Louisiana, Louisiana to, uh, to Ontario to summer, uh, I guess, to escape the Louisiana heat um, and uh, swim in the cold lakes and co on those hot, hot days. Um, so it's uh, the, the applicant identified that the building has original woodwork, has uh, front sitting room, uh, original floors and windows, uh, brickwork, uh, and those towering chimneys are quite unique, but common to... Um, Queen Anne style. Uh, there's several stained glass windows as well as servants' belts. And also in the basement, there's a large uh, safe, large original safe that's actually built into the foundation of the building. Don't have a picture of that here, but it, um, uh, I did see it when the house was listed for sale a while back, and it is very cool. It's got a big, big uh, steel door. Um, so I, I actually identified this building to have high degree of craftsmanship and artistic merit because it is a Queen Anne. Um, and just the, the work involved in all those panels of wood on the walls. Um, it, it does have a high degree of craftsmanship. Um, and it, is also, it also has contextual value because it is important in defining, maintaining, and supporting the character of uh, Kemenfeld Village. And as well, it is uh, physically and, and visually linked to its surroundings. So based on that, I would certainly recommend that this building be listed as well. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there's one little correction. It's not actually in Kempenfeld Village. It's um, oh. in the East End, if you will. Okay. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not that far east uh, as Kempenfeld Village. But um, any comments, co uh, thoughts, questions on those two? All right. Um, Kathy, yeah. Just um, two comments. Maybe this is one that we put on the list to, uh, to designate um you know going forward because certainly 
based on that craftsmanship. And the other comment that I would have is, I think if I remember correctly, when we were at Sue Murdoch's home, which is 47 Rodney, which is also designated, she talked about a time when, uh, and because of the elevation difference between where she is and where this home is, that there was an actual fire happening uh, at her place. And it was the person that lived in this house at that time uh, at 11 Rodney Street who actually saw the fire happening and notified them and notified the fire department. So that was kind of cool. Yeah, it's, it, um, I've been in that house and it it's is stunning. pretty spectacular, you bet. Yeah. All right. Um, the motion that we have then is that the properties known municipally as the following be added to the Municipal Heritage Register as listed properties, 101 Cumberland Street and 11 Rodney Street. Any discussion on that? All those in favor? No, nobody's opposed. Thank you very much. That passes. All right. Um, open Air Dunlop uh, is the next item. Uh, David. Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, I have two, uh, two, I, two suggestions on that uh, matter. I've been following uh, the news story and I think an email about dates coming up. So we don't have anything or an invitation, so to speak, on open air just yet. But uh, I would suggest that that's probably forthcoming. And I'll try and uh, put together, with your permission, a, a list or forward what I get from them uh, in terms of dates and when we might participate. Uh, there's also city events, and I don't know if the city has announced uh, seasonal events yet. Um, the only the one that we used to participate in, of course, was uh, the Berry Community Day, or such as it was in June. Uh, so we could include that in our suggestions as well, hopefully. Uh, so in terms of unless now other members may have more up to date information. So uh, just on the dates and things, um, uh, we'll I'll try and keep a tab on that and try and make a suggestion. What I might like is everyone to think about how we participated last year and the number of times and their value. And uh, perhaps very soon we'll need to decide when and where and everybody think about what's worth it and how often we should participate. Um, they were mostly quite successful. Um, the only other item, the other item I have on that is that Shelley had a quote on our tents and canopies, if I can discuss that now as well. Um, I followed up on the quote from Flags Unlimited, which is local, of course. And uh, I think in the past, there's been, uh, it, we've, we, it, we've had some positive response to having our own canopy and tables for, at the very least. Uh, and I retrieved the quote. And what I'll do is I'm going to follow up the contact, the contact at Flags and just make this a little more or get this reconfirmed in terms of some numbers here. Um, I would suggest that if going forward, uh, that I agree with the local supplier. Um, I had one other lead, but I'm not certain I still have that. Uh, that the canopy, a printed canopy, a frame, a bag, uh, is approximately would be approximately seven hundred and fifty dollars. With the canopy at five hundred, the frame at two fifty, the bag at fifteen, and then. I would add, a, say, $100 for two tables would be appropriate. I'm not certain I see the value in printed uh, throws, like table throws or, uh, you know, uh, the one they get covered up and they're very expensive here on the, on the quote. Uh, and that our budget is only $500 for those. So another area for discussion. Uh, tables at another 100, we're looking at certainly upwards of with this type of a quote, upwards of over $900 with taxes. Uh, and that's perhaps without some weights, you know, that we should have the proper weights for it as well. Anyways, uh, with, with everyone's agreement, I'll follow up on this quote and try and make a recommendation on, uh, on that if we would like to follow up with Flags Unlimited. Uh, also, I did, they did give me a, a page on 
instructions, and I was interested to see on what the what the frame was like. Was it sturdy? Or is it well built? And again, I'll I'll try and get more on that. Uh, it even notes parts available from Flags Unlimited, so that sounds good to be dealing locally as well. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, I might say to you that um, uh, you may very well your invitation to the dates from the BIA may be in the mail to you. Um, and if not, uh, you could always check with Stacy at the BIA. And right. She probably has some information for you there. Um, and, uh, and certainly I, I realize that we have $500 in the budget, but we do have a bit of unallocated money as well. So uh, we, okay. could probably, we could probably stretch that a little bit. Um, uh, Craig and then Thomas. I was just going to say, um, I think uh, some members mentioned about uh, maybe the farmer's market. Um, so, you know, if we did, you know, I don't know what, what the, what time dates we're going to do, but let's say we did uh, one, a couple of farmer's markets and then we did some of the, you know, if the city has something and then a few of the other things, then it'd be nice to maybe change it up. Cause uh, I think, Kaylee and Sarah had mentioned how they, they, the market was great. And it seems like, you know, it's, it's going to be opening up a little bit and it's sort of a different clientele. So I think that's a great idea too. Yeah. I think that's really worth exploring because you're right. You do to get a different crowd uh, there. Um, Thomas, I think I saw you. Thank you, Thank you Chair. I uh, just wanted to give some more details around dates. So it looks like they're starting in June at the start of June and going all the way through to end of September. So that's 17 Saturdays. So that's a, that's a fairly significant commitment. So I don't know if a committee wants to attend all of those, especially if you want to go to the farmer's market as well. And I think um, I, um, I think it was, um, I can't remember the name. I think it was We Love Berry. It was a, another event. There, there's multiple events. There's hot summer nights as well, um, things like that. So I just don't, I worried about the committee uh, going uh, suffering from event fatigue, you know, um, that's a long summer going every, every Saturday. So um, maybe, maybe be strategic around which weekends we'd want to go to. Thanks very much. I think that's a, that's a really good point. We don't want to burn ourselves out either. Kathy. Hey, come on. We haven't been out in two years. We need to get out and about. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say. Um, I just, I had a question and I think we might've talked about it at some point, but one of the things that I, I think would be nice to do is, you know, the heritage banner that we have right now that has all the beautiful historical photos is it would be nice to do one that is current day photos of some of the beautiful homes that we have. So not just the older ones that we don't, that we demolished because people like to always hang on, oh, you know, we're really bad at demolishing everything. We need to also show that we still have a lot of beautiful historic buildings. And so maybe at some point we could put together uh, a banner similar to that, um, um, just to be at the opposite side of the tent. So I don't know what people think of that, but we certainly have a lot of beautiful buildings. Yep. And in fact, I think our banner actually has a picture uh, of a historic building that is still standing in downtown. Um, and you can, when you're, when you're at the Cenotaph area, you can point people at the picture and at the building still. So, um, but it is a great idea. We'll, we can pick that up uh, in the future. Any other comments on that? Okay, uh, David, you're doing a great job on that. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to your recommendations uh, probably next month. I would imagine you'll have it figured out. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Oh, Kathy. I'm going to pull a Shelly. Um, uh, so what I want to know is who's going to run with um, just finding out information about the Berry Farmers Market. So if you go on their website, I think previously, um, it actually talks about community organizations and what you can have two or three dates. Craig, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I'll um, do it. I'll, yeah. I'll do it. And just so, yeah, so that we know how many dates we can have and because uh, the manager is different. So it used to be Patricia Lancia and it's a different manager now. So it's somebody else, I'm not sure who, but. Um. Okay. Yes, I'm sure that they'll be happy to have us if we're willing to go. Okay. Um, 
Next, we have education material for her heritage events. Um, Thomas, is that yours? Yes, I think the last few items on the agenda will are mine, Chair. Um, uh, and I probably share this one with Kaylee. Um, so we, Kaylee, did provide us with the edu uh, with the drawing material. We provided those to our communications team. Um, they reviewed them and provided some feedback. And I think Kaylee, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm still just waiting for those uh, re revised materials uh, to be um, returned back to me. Um, and then once they're finalized, um, it's just a matter of printing them. So we have quite a bit of time. So if we're not going to start going to Open Air Dunlop until June, we have at least May um, to get all the material put together. Um, so we're, we're um, I think we're all, we're all, sorry, well on our way to having this item completed. Good, yes. And Kaylee did a terrific job on, on mm -hmm. uh, those things. They were beautiful, well, very well done. And um, I'm sure that we'll, uh, kids will enjoy them. Uh, David. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, a slight backup here. If I could just ask Thomas, please, would the comms team need to approve and or suggest printing on a canopy, if on a gazebo, on our tent? So, uh, so this is for the material. So, material that we would use or um, uh, like a cover or something like that. I, I, yes. I think we do need to um, have everything sort of approved by a communications team. Right. We, we are a subsidiary of the city of Barrie. So just, um, they just essentially do quality control. We want to make sure that everything that's going out there is meeting their communication standard and we're not using the wrong font or something like that. So, um, but yes, so I would build that in your timeline if that's what you're thinking. Yes, I will. That's fine. Good. Thank you. Yeah, the answer to that is definitely yes. All right, um, we've talked about the town crier. And um, so the last item on our agenda is uh, development and applications under review. Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, there is two items, uh, I believe, on the agenda for discussion. Um, the, and none of them really need an, uh, any sort of uh, decision or, or, or any sort of in-depth really discussion. It's more of an update. Uh, just to let the committee know, because I'm sure the addresses that are on the uh, on the actual agenda are, are of, um, maybe not concerned, but of interest to the committee, being 21 and 27 Cumberland Street. So that um, is uh, actually a lot that was a new lot that was created in between 21 and 27. So there's a new lot that's being created there. Um, and uh, that lot has been created at the last committee. Uh, and uh, the applicant is now having to go back to the committee to ask for a few variances, um, as they were they were not able to meet some of the variance, some of the standards for that lot, uh, so they can build on that property. Um, so there's there's no real um, there's as far as I know there's no demolition happening. Um, so the, and the property is not subject to site plan control under the Allendale um, site plan, <clears throat> so they'd be going straight to building permit. Um, and as far as planning staff are aware, they're going to be putting a single on that property because they wouldn't be able to fit anything else. So it may be a single with an accessory, uh, detached accessory or detached accessory dwelling unit. We haven't seen that. We don't actually know what's going to be built there until mm -hmm. the building permit comes in. Um, but um, that that is sort of the background for that uh, for that item. And um, does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, Kathy. I did, uh, not really any questions, but I actually was on the committee of adjustment meeting when this one went through and I thought that it, everything got passed. So are you saying that they, that they're sort of, they have to go back to committee of adjustment? Yes. So the lot was created. Right. Um, so that was probably what the committee had, um, had approved, but now they have to go back to, to, to get oh. some setbacks. And for, so they're varying from the standards for that zone. Um, right, and, because um, because of a new building permit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fine. That seems a bit curious, uh, Thomas. Um, why would the committee create a lot that um, then you have to do a whole bunch of variances for? Is it because they're building too big a house on it, or what is it that they're doing? Um, I believe when they went to register the creation of the lot, there was errors um, in the actual size of the lot. Um, so they are trying to correct those errors through a minor variance. 
Um, and I'm just trying to pull up the actual variance itself because I had um, a bit of a reset in my, in my computer, but that was, I spoke with the, the planner who was reviewing the file and managing the file and that is the reasoning for that. Um, if you could just give me one more moment, I can maybe pull it up. I don't believe there's a notice issued yet for that. And I don't know why I cannot find it. So let's go with 27 Cumberland. Apologies, I probably should have had this up already. Yeah. <clears throat> Kathy, do you um, perhaps have the number of that variance? Actually, I think I do as well, uh, isn't it? Yes, it's I... a, a 10, 22 and 22, okay. Okay, 10, yeah, this was this was even weird because there also was a demolition permit out on one of them, and it was the, I think it was twenty one, which is a really unique Mansard house, um, like a bungalow Mansard house, but it wasn't actually for the house. It, I think it was for a structure like a shed in the back. But when you look at the permit, it doesn't say that. So you, we didn't know we were worried about what was being demolished. And when we had that committee of adjustment meeting, we asked that question, whether the intent was to demolish, to demolish the actual house. And he said, no. That's right. So as far as I understand, there's no demolition happening. This is a yeah. newly created lot. Uh, so the variance is for, so the, the notice was just posted uh, just recently. So it's to recognize an existing front yard setback of 2.74 meters of the main dwelling. Uh, whereas the minimum front yard setback is three meters uh, as approved by the Committee of Adjustment. Um, so it looks like they're doing a correction. And that is for A10-2020 or 22. And there is also, I believe there's also a notice for uh, 27 Cumberland Street, which is A11-2022. And there's another variance for both 27 and 21 Cumberland Street, which is A12, 2022. So I'm gonna look at that quickly. So there's actually three variances, but they're all interrelated. But yeah, because one of them, 27, I think is a double lot. And there is room, there would actually be room to do another single single dwelling. Um, um, no, Kathy, so they've, 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 they've done essentially a boundary yeah, adjustment where they've severed. moved things around. Yeah, yeah they've so they've severed, severed the yeah. Um, so because they had severed things um, when they created or created the new lot, essentially shrinking 27, right. I don't, don't think they recognize the deficiency and right. they're doing that now sort of retroactively. Right. Um, so, so let me ask you, who didn't recognize the deficiency? I don't the have planning any. staff. Well, or? essentially committee. It wasn't done at committee. So um, I don't want to point if it's the applicant right, staff. No, I just, it's just it was it should have been done. Uh, it just wasn't. So they've they believe they were doing a correction here as well. Okay. Um, so the new lot uh, um, looks like there's a request to permit a minimum lot frontage of 15.9 meters, um, where 15.54 was approved by the committee back in October. So again, it's just a correction. Um, mm -hmm. So these, these are all corrections to ensure that the lot that's being created is mm. um, um, is reflected basically, and it's not uh, it's not meeting the standards of that zone. So they're making all these corrections here and there. Okay. So is there a um, somewhere is there a picture of what the what the house is going to look like? Not at this time. Uh, we don't have anything like that. So that would come at the building permit stage. Right. So okay. There's there's been nothing submitted. If this was a property that was uh, part of the site plan control, right. we'd probably have something, but because this property right. is not, we do, we do not. Right. Okay. And you had another one uh, as well, Thomas? It's, um, yes, so there is, uh, so there's three for 21 and 27 Cumberland, but it's all related to recognizing uh, deficiencies with two retained lots and one newly created lot. Um, and the other entirely standalone item was regarding 79, um, mm -hmm. 79 Collier, Collier Street. And mm -hmm. of course, that property is next to the uh, Simcoe, uh, Grace Simcoe Forster's Reg Regimental Museum. And there is six 
Um, there is six variances re uh, being requested. Uh, I can go through all of them. Uh, we have a little bit of time. So the first one is to permit a maximum gross flow area of 725% versus 600%, which is permitted in that zone. Uh, to permit 50 meters of height within three meters of the front, light, front line and lot uh, flankage and 55 meters beyond three meters. So they're essentially asking for a little bit more height closer to the lot line. They're asking for uh, a reduction in uh, commercial uses from 50% to 34%. Um, uh, they're asking for a reduction in parking from one space per dwelling unit to 0.86 spaces per dwelling unit. Um, there's also a reduction of the landscape buffer from three meters to uh, no landscape buffer areas. Uh, and they're also requesting of a reduction to the, to the driveway. Um, uh, from what is required, which is, which is 6.4 meters to six meters. Um, so it's, it's essentially reduction of, of some, an exceedance of some of the standards. Um, it, I looked at these and in my opinion, I don't think any of these changes individually or, or collectively are gonna have a negative impact um, on, the, on the historic building. And um, so I, I, I'm, not being, I'm not submitting comments on this um, on this item to the committee. Does it make a substantial or does it make a significant difference to the building that the committee looked at? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think these are results of small refinements on the property. For example, the, the gross floor area, that's not gonna make a difference to, to the design. Um, the one design change, um, is regarding the minimum drive aisle width of 6.4. Um, and that drive aisle is on the, on the uh, west side of the property. So it's not, it's not, so if there is gonna be a change, it's not gonna be something meaningful to the, to the, to the committee. Okay, that's, that's important to know. All right, Kathy, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just gonna, uh, two, two quick questions. So the side that you're talking about, um, Thomas with the 6.4, the drive, that's on the, did you say the west side? Uh, yes, sir, if I remember correctly, I'm gonna pull okay, it up. So, that, so that's where they would be driving in um, alongside the building that's on Collier Street, not Mulcaster. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yeah, so I think there's a dental office or a hair salon or something right there. Um, I think that's what you're talking about. So that wouldn't have any impact, but the one, that I had, I did have a question about was when, where they're talking about a three meter, what was it? Three meter from I, zero. It, it, what should be three meters is now zero. Mm -hmm. it's a, is it a, is that a side setback or a back setback? Okay, sorry. Let me see here. Oh. We're referring to three meters. Oh, sorry. So uh, oh, landscape provision, buffer, I forget. Landscape buffer width of three meters is yeah. required. Uh, yeah. So they're at, they're asking for uh, no landscape buffer areas. So it'll either all be uh, paved or driveway or uh, something that used for transportation, whereas we refer to landscape buffer areas as not being used for that. Um, and I'm looking at the notice and it doesn't identify exactly where that would be. Um, I am looking right now. That's I was tr trying to figure out whether um, that would have any impact down the side of because they still show, I think they still show raised, raised flower boxes or something yes. down the side. But then what about the back? So those raised flower planters right. are uh, in sort of that walking area that's yes. between the building. And so right. those are still staying there. Right. And um, then on the back side of the building itself? You mean along sort of that laneway? Yes. Um, I don't think there was ever... Uh, a landscape buffer area there. Um, it was always right to the lot line, right to the property line. Right, okay. And I'm trying to So there's, so there's gonna be, there's no greening up of anything really because no. we're removing this. So we're looking at more cement and pavement. Well, it's, it's just the definition of landscape uh, area. So um, you can put patio pavers or paving stones on your driveway or right. next to your driveway and that is still technically landscape open space. It doesn't necessarily mean that there will be things planted there. Okay. Um, it just means it wouldn't be used for 
parking, whereas the re reduction of this uh, landscape open space area means that it could be used for driving or parking or walking and things like that. But I'm looking at the, the, the notice and there's still raised planters. Yes. I'm sorry, raised planters along Collier Street. Right. But I see one, two, uh, three, four, uh, right along the front edge of Collier Street. Um, and there was never any proposed along the frontage of Mulcaster. So that is going to be that wall with the masonry. Um, right. We'll talk to the applicant about um, doing some etched stone or glass or things like that um, on that on that wall. So I'm not entirely sure where the reduction for uh, landscape open space is coming from. Um, I don't think they had any landscape open space to begin with. <laughs> and they're just recognizing that through the site plan. But if, if that's a concern to the committee, I can ask the applicant and always circle back by email if, if that's what the committee would like. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think it's just, uh, my question would be, is there a difference, particularly in the area of the, of the Forester's building, no, the armory, um, it does, has the building changed in that area? Like, is the building moving closer or is there something that, that would impact the, uh, the old armory? In my in my review of this, I don't see that, um, but I will I can circle back with the applicant and just ask them for to the confirm that the design that was shown to the committee a few months back um, is not going to change substantially to you know from what is being asked as of right now. Okay, well that would be I think that if there's anything that, that would have the impact on the uh, on, on the uh, on the building, Sarah. <clears throat> Uh, thanks. I just had a couple things. Um, in terms of impact, uh, is there a way to ask them, or when you ask them, to ask about um, impacts to the overall view or like uh, any increases to shadows that would be on to the historic building? That's something that normally you look at as part of the impact study. So if anything like that would be changing. Um, and then if there's any changes to the overall design that would then therefore impact uh, the overall construction of the building that would potentially impact the neighboring building, because I believe they needed to come up with a heritage impact plan to make sure that nothing is going to uh, happen to the Forester's building during construction. So it would just be to make sure that there's uh, whatever updates happen to the design plan also are taken into account for construction and therefore into account to that heritage impact plan if that makes sense yeah. can you, can you share it? it does make sense um so all the provisions that they had recommended before being the vibration monitor monitoring that's still going to be in place we're, we're not asking them to, uh, to remove any of that um, it's just double checking to see if there's anything that would require additional mitigate, mitigate, mitigative measures. Um, I don't, the, from the variances that are being requested, I don't think anything will change, but we will confirm that. Okay, um, Kathy. I just had one last question. When, when the time comes for shovels in the ground, um, sort of on a go forward of the construction project overall, is there like what kind of oversight or actual monitoring is being done by the city being that this is a city building? Mm -hmm. So is there a, like a staff member or like, do we have a construction dude or an engineering guy that, you know, will just maybe pop by, you know, every couple of days and check out, see what's going on over there? So the, <laughs> because uh, it's a, they, you know, because it is a designated building and, um, you know, I, you know, I've, I've seen construction happen just up and down our streets and it's pretty scary because there is no oversight. And once the permits signed off, it's really, you know, you wipe, you wipe your hands of it, but because this is your building, is somebody going to be sort of some sort of over uh, oversight and monitoring happening? Thomas. Uh, good question, Kathy. The applicant is going to sign a development agreement. Uh, or sorry, site plan agreement with the city. Uh, and in that agreement, they're going to have to have a qualified professional do vibration monitoring. Um, 
and it is, and um, as far as I understand it, we don't have an enforcement team. Uh, we'll have, we have, of course, our building team that's going to be out there doing building inspections. Hmm. Uh, we also have our landscape architects that go out there and, and essentially do site plan enforcement hmm. on certain items. Um, I don't believe there's going to be anybody out there making sure that there is a qualified individual out there doing vibration monitoring. That would be, that is the responsibility of the developer to ensure that they're doing that. Mm. Um, um, I, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I, I would doubt that they would not do that, um, you know, and risk this uh, a work stop order and the site plan being revoked, um, incurring, I, I don't even know how much money that would cost them in terms of construction delays and things like that. So. Um, but we can, conf I can confirm that for you too, Kathy, and look into if there is somebody that goes out there and does um, co the compliance inspections regarding the site plan. Well, I know or, or in if, yeah, yeah, it would be nice to just give you, give us a little bit of a, um, you know, we, we know that it's being looked after. Okay. Any other questions or comments on that one? All right, I think that brings us to the end of our agenda. So, um, Kathy, did you have something else? Yeah. A, a couple of things. Um, I, I was wanting to ask about um, 1012 Young Street and 459 Young Street, maybe adding them. A, but I'm not sure 459, I still have to do a little homework on that. So 101, 1012 Young Street is the, um, uh, an old farmhouse. And um, I was out today and took some photos and I'm just wondering about, uh, um, you know, having a look at that and maybe putting that on a list of some sort, Thomas, I'm not sure um, what we wanna do with that. Okay, um, well, you can have that discussion with Thomas, um, you know, offline, I guess. Um, it's not on our agenda at this point, so. Um, okay, anything else? Oh, oh, oh. Kathy? <laughs> we did do a, um, a recording um, for BDAR that Thomas did send along to BDAR, I think just the last couple of days. So we actually did a, do a presentation um, about the Century Homes and about the SIP program and um, about li listing property. So that's something that, uh, that's been sent along to BDAR. And Thomas, were we gonna share that with the group or just send them a link if they wanna see it? Yeah, I think that's the best thing to do is just send a link out. Yeah. Can do. Okay. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the agenda. Thank you very much for all your hard work again tonight. And uh, we will uh, see you uh, in a month's time, uh, May the 11th. Okay. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night, Good night